Hi, it's Dwyer. Today is Friday, August the 10th, 2018. Let's talk about Alexander Povetkin's challenge to Anthony Joshua. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let's be clear here. My own personal bias. I really do feel that this could be a golden age of heavyweights. You have some of the more exciting heavyweights I've seen, right? Knockout punchers, guys who let it hang out, slick southpaws, right? Who undress opponents and who also throw power. You have cruiserweights entering the division who look to be more experienced and more skilled to these eyes than some of the heavyweight champions. You have trash talkers with great jabs who are willing to fight anyone, right, anyone, and who when they do try to own the pocket. Don't try to shirk from the spotlight. Actively look for the spotlight. And you have gifted fighters who for some reason seem to have too casual an approach in fights, right? They have power. They can drop anyone, but for some reason in a unification match, didn't push the envelope in the bout after the unification match didn't really push the envelope, right? So, let's just say, I find today's heavyweight division to be fascinating. But what I want people to do right here, right? Two minutes and 10 seconds into the video, is to think of the three biggest names at heavyweight right now. I would say that it's a WBC champion, Deontay Wilder, it's the champion for several other sanctioning bodies, Anthony Joshua, and it's the lineal heavyweight champion, Tyson Fury, right? Understand, Tyson Fury at one point owned the belts that Wilder and Joshua own, right? Now, in thinking about these guys, just close your eyes for a moment and ask yourself, who's the most distinguished opponent that Tyson Fury faced in his career to date, right? I believe the answer is Vladimir Klitschko, who even then is in his later 30s, right? Who's the most distinguished opponent that Anthony Joshua has faced in his career? Here again, I would say it's Vladimir Klitschko, again, in his late 30s. Right? Even older than he was when he fought Fury. Worse yet, of course, that fight was after a several-month layoff. A layoff, in fact, of more than a year. Close your eyes for a moment and ask yourself, who's the most distinguished person that Deontay Wilder ever fought? I believe the answer there is Luis Ortiz. Again, a heavyweight in his later 30s. Right, folks, these guys at the top of the heavyweight division, understand the three guys are all unbeaten, right, are relatively untested, right, they're relatively untested. When you see a lot of guys who are unbeaten, at heavyweight, you have to start asking the question, how is this possible? How could they not have crossed paths? Right? We figured out how it's possible with the Deontay Wilder, Anthony Joshua situation, right? Wilder wants to cross paths. Anthony Joshua doesn't. Let me also just add an aside here. I know many of you have been 
writing in the comment section to videos and emailing me privately that you feel I've been too tough, too tough on Anthony Joshua, right? Okay, I understand the sentiment is out there and I admit I have said critical statements of him, right? But let me just say I honestly could not imagine a whole group of fighters with the title being offered a unification match against a big time rival, a guy who's 40 and O, who's calling you out, who would not leap at that opportunity. I honestly, in my wildest dreams, couldn't envision a Joe Fraser deciding that he's not going to accept Ali's challenge. Right? A guy like Carl Frotch, you knew he was going to fight Andre Ward sooner or later. Right? You understood that he didn't want to be Swen Aki. He understood, hey, I need to fight Andre Ward. I need to fight Lucien Boutte. Right? Joe Calzaghe had to fight Mikael Kessler. Right? Had to. Late in his career, Calzaghe decided, look, I'm about to retire. Let me travel to the United States to fight Bernard Hopkins and Roy Jones. Right? Let me return to Joe Fraser for a second. You know, Joe Fraser, an argument can be made, the two toughest opponents that he faced in his career for his style were Ali, who he faced when Ali was unbeaten, right? Just like Wilder is now. And George Foreman, who he faced when George Foreman was unbeaten, like Wilder is right now. Now think about it. Those are the two toughest guys, and I'll leave the comment section open to the historians here, but those are arguably the two toughest guys that Joe Fraser faces, right? He faces them in their prime when they're on top of the mountain, right? There's no Manny Pacquiao, Floyd Mayweather, let's wait five years for the fight. No, Joe Fraser faces them in their prime, right? He ends up facing Ali three times. He ends up facing jo George Foreman twice. In other words, Joe Fraser, against the toughest opponents he faced, faces them in their prime, and then has his rematches. The Ali trilogy really isn't decided until the later rounds. And I'm talking about after the 12th round, folks of the third fight, right? Thriller in Manila, right? You would have thought that Joe Fraser, who didn't have a good night the first time he fought George Foreman, would have said, of all the guys in the world, this is the last brother I'm going to fight again. Guess what? He wanted the fight. Guess what? Joe Fraser came out in the rematch and was on his front foot. Right? That's who he is. So, no, I'm not backing away from criticizing a reigning unbeaten heavyweight champion who, with big money on the table, tens of millions of dollars, right? Tens of millions of dollars on the table, with him coming off of a big fight against Joseph Parker and Deontay Wilder coming off of a big fight the toughest of his career against Luis Ortiz, a fight where the doctor steps in the ring, looks into Wilder's eyes, had the doctor said he can't continue, his title would have been over, right? That's how trying that Ortiz fight was. Wilder makes it through that. So with all that momentum, with Wilder calling out Joshua offering a huge purse with Wilder even saying look okay I'll fight you in your country I'll cross the ocean 
Instead of me talking about that fight, I'm talking about Joshua against a mandatory for one of his belts. Let's be clear here. Let's remember heavyweight history. There's a time where a reigning heavyweight champion, Riddick Bowe, once held a press conference and said to the camera, I'm the heavyweight champion of the world. And today I am stripping, he had a belt on him. He said, I'm stripping this sanctioning body of my recognition. He threw the belt in the garbage. Now, I agree. He should have fought Lennox Lewis. Right? He threw the belt in the garbage because the sanctioning body was saying, you need to fight Lennox Lewis. Right? I agree. He should have fought Lennox Lewis. But just understand there's a history in the heavyweight division of guys saying, look, this sanctioning body doesn't own me. Right? The sanctioning body doesn't own me. If the biggest fight on the table is Deontay Wilder, in my opinion, Joshua should have said, look, everyone in the world knows I'm an unbeaten heavyweight champion. I just beat Joseph Parker to unify some titles. Right? If one of these sanctioning bodies wants to strip me of a belt, they can go ahead and do so. The public knows I'm a champion. The guy who picks that belt up out of the garbage knows they're going to have to face me sooner or later. Folks, right now at Middleweight, did you know that one of the sanctioning bodies has stripped Gennady Golovkin? It wouldn't have happened if Canelo hadn't eaten tainted meat. But because Canelo ate tainted meat, the rematch as originally scheduled got postponed. And so, of course, the sanctioning body steps out of the woodwork and said, hey, we gave you a variance here with instructions that you had to fight our mandatory contender by this day. Right? Golovkin says, hey, I didn't have any taint in me. I was signed to fight Canelo. I'm going to fight Canelo. Sanctioning body stripped him. Could you have ever imagined or envisioned that Canelo would say, whoa, wait a moment. I'm not going to lose this belt. Excuse me, not Canelo Golovkin. Could you imagine Golovkin saying, hey, wait a moment. I'm not going to lose this belt. Even though the public wants to see the rematch of my draw, officially, against Canelo, I'm going to pivot here and I'm going to fight this mandatory over here. Well, that's what we have at heavyweight. So I understand. There are Joshua people here. And in the comment section, let's all look for it. There are going to be a bunch of statements saying, Dwyer hates Joshua. Dwyer hates Joshua. The truth is, all I'm doing is asking Joshua to do the same thing that Joe Fraser did in the early 70s. The same thing that Mike Tyson did in the later 80s. Right? Fight another currently reigning unbeaten champion. Right? He chose not to do so. Okay, fine. So let's talk about this fight. Now let me just say this. You know these heavyweights are unproven. If the toughest guys they fought are all guys in their late 30s. Right? That's the reality. Joshua got his heavyweight title by beating Charles Martin. Right? In the pantheon of heavyweight champions, let's face it, Charles Martin is really a guy who belongs on the side of a milk cart. Right? Most people have a hard time remembering him today. And that fight wasn't too long ago. Right? So Josh was really relatively untested. I know he fought Dylan White. Dylan White was rusty coming off a of suspension. Right? Hadn't fought that much. Dylan White has told people, he's given interviews where he talks about how he hurts his shoulder after what I thought was a very intriguing first round. Right? Let's face it too. 
that Dylan White Derek Chisora fight was competitive, wasn't it? Right, so Anthony Joshua really is untested. Joseph Parker, let's talk about him. Now, I feel that Parker is one of the more talented guys at heavyweight. By the way, I still feel that way. But, just to be blunt, Parker lost the fight after losing to Anthony Joshua, didn't he? He gets caught with a good left hook and goes down against Dylan White. Doesn't he? In other words, when you look at the resume of Anthony Joshua, you don't really have the name that stands out that we today still think was a big bad wolf type character. Right? Klitschko is coming off of a loss. Joshua beats him. Right? People looked at Klitschko's performance against Fury. They thought it was lackluster. They thought maybe Klitschko got old all at once. He then waits more than a year before fighting Joshua. Right? So Joshua, unproven champion, young guy, promising. Right? Promising. But his last fight goes the distance first time in his career. He doesn't come close to knocking out Parker. Right? The Carlos Tackham fight, that's another fight to pay attention to. Right? Del Boy, Chisora, roughed up Tackham more than Anthony Joshua did. Right? Tackham looked surprised they were stopping the fight late in that fight. I'm not saying Tackham was close to being a hand on the scorecards. I'm not saying that. But let's just say the performance wasn't a young George Foreman, a young Mike Tyson, a young Lennox Lewis type of performance where you see it and you're thinking to yourself, is there anybody who can beat this guy? Right? It wasn't exactly Bo Holifield. So, to the gamblers, because that's my core constituency, right? Understand, this site is not a fan site, right? I'm not trying to get interviews with the fighters, right? Let me just say, I have an open invitation. If a fighter wants to comment on a video, and a few fighters have contacted me privately, but no one's taken me up on the offer, Rather than have me interview them in some cheesy Oprah-type interview where I'm saying, oh, what were you thinking in that third round? The fighter can make their own video and can point out where I'm wrong. Okay, that, you know, I'll play it unedited here on the site. I don't expect any fighter to take me up on that. Let me also point out, too, that I've been contacted over the years by some people associated with the fighters. I don't play that game, right? Because all of these fighters have entourages. And someone says, hey, I'm associated with so-and-so. You don't know if the fighter even knows that person, <laughs> right? So I'm not going to have people online here saying, hey, I'm with the Joshua camp. And, you know, it's not Eddie Hearn. It's not Joshua. I'm supposed to believe some guy who I've never met before uh, is embedded in the camp. All right, well, let's get back to gambling here. This is not a fan club site. Now understand, odds are supposed to reflect the fighter's chances of winning the fight. Right? That's what they're supposed to reflect, folks. Right? You're supposed to look at a fighter and say, gee, if these guys fought three times, how many times would this guy win? Right? How many times would that guy win? If one guy would win two of the three, then he goes off at a two to one odds, right? Two, he wins, one, the other guy wins. That's how you get a two to one odds, right? Now, just to understand who Alexander Povetkin is, right? I believe Povetkin is a real tough opponent here. 
right? While I criticize Joshua for not fighting Wilder because that's the historical fight. Wilder already has a title. Wilder's unbeaten. Povetkin doesn't have a title and is not unbeaten. Right? Understand I privately feel that Joshua's really risking it all against a guy the public thinks he should walk through, who's actually a tough opponent. So understand, Povetkin has a history. Like Joshua, Povetkin is a former Olympic champion. Like Joshua, Povetkin has held a heavyweight title. Folks, he's a former heavyweight champion. Like Joshua, he fought Vladimir Klitschko in his backyard. Both guys fought Klitschko in their backyards. Understand, Povetkin went the distance with Vladimir Klitschko. Right? Interesting fight. It's Klitschko who's holding on to Povetkin. Povetkin's not afraid. Povetkin's not running away. Povetkin is trying to bring the fight to Vladimir Klitschko, who keeps hitting him on the way in, and then hugging him. Now, that Klitschko loss remains Povetkin's only loss. Right? So, we all understand that he doesn't have AJ's punch, but he moves better than AJ. Right? AJ's not a guy who's up on his toes dancing around the ring. Povetkin is a very good athlete. Right? Excellent athlete, in fact. Povetkin also trades punches a bit more than Anthony Joshua. He's kind of like Chris Eubank. Right? You need to think of it as a chain of events. If Povetkin starts to throw Right? And he feels that he's ahead of you. In other words, he starts a combination and he feels you're adjusting to him. Even as you're throwing punches back, he'll keep throwing punches. Right? He'll keep coming forward on his front foot. David Price is not just standing there waiting to get hit. David Price is trading heavy shots with Povetkin. Now, some fighters will cover up. They'll back away. Povetkin is the kind of guy who, when the bullets start flying, if he sees a way to the goal line, if he sees a way to score, he's going to double down. Right? That makes him scary. Now, let me just say, Forget the records. Forget the records. Given that both of these guys fought Klitschko, right? AJ wins late. Gets off the canvas to win late. Right? Povetkin goes the distance. In other words, Povetkin has faced the toughest guy that AJ has faced. Right? Given that Povetkin himself was an exalted amateur, gold medal winner, has held a heavyweight title. Right? Given that Povetkin has also fought guys like Marco Huck, right? who to me is a tougher matchup for Povetkin because Huck, great athlete himself. Just close your eyes for a moment and ask yourself if these guys fought eight times, eight, how many of those bouts would you expect Povetkin to win? Folks, he's only lost once, and that was by decision in a fight where Vladimir Klitschko held him. In a way, we have not seen Joshua able to hold anyone in his career. Right? 
The argument I'm making to you here is that the line right now is preposterous. Prevetkin has to be looking across the ring and has to be thinking he's fighting a relatively young champion. A guy who hasn't been around as long as him. Right? But yet the casino, believe it or not, is giving you plus 700 odds on Alexander Prevetkin in the fight. Right? Understand, if you feel Prevetkin has a one in four chance of beating Joshua, right? Just one in four. Just understand the casino is giving you much longer odds than that. Prevetkin would be mispriced, right? Mispriced under that standard. He'd be underrated under that standard. The bet I'm recommending here is that you take Prevetkin at 7-1 to one to win the fight. Right? 7-1 to one lines don't belong in boxing between young champions, right, who are relatively unproven, whose biggest win was over a fighter that the other guy has already fought and gone the distance against. Right? If a fighter is a legitimate mandatory contender, there's no way he should be a 7-1 to one underdog. Especially when the guy he's fighting isn't, let's say, a proven Lennox Lewis. A proven Mike Tyson. So the bet I'm recommending is to take Prevetkin at 7-1, to one because the odds are that compelling. And to hedge the play with the under 8.5 rounds. Again, the under 8.5 rounds at a minus 160. Understand, you can subsidize a minus 160 because you're getting a plus 700 on the other side of the bet. Let me say this. If Anthony Joshua doesn't really hurt Prevetkin, and this fight makes it past the midway point of the ninth round, Joshua's going to be in a lot of trouble. Right? In other words, Joshua really does have to come out and does have to hurt Prevetkin significantly in the earlier rounds. Because if Prevetkin is still in the game past the midway point of the ninth round, he is more experienced than Joshua. He has the better legs than Joshua because he lost to Klitschko in a fight where he made the mistake of constantly being front foot. He's not going to do that here. Right? Understand, too. Prevetkin was scheduled to fight Deontay Wilder for Wilder's heavyweight title. Wilder was all set to travel to Prevetkin's backyard for the match. Right? There was big money involved in that fight. Right? Promoters were prepared to have that fight in Russia. And that's when Prevetkin failed a drug test. What that should tell you is this guy who held a share of the heavyweight title, who fought Klitschko, has been world-class long enough where he's been the mandatory contender for Wilder's title, and now he's the mandatory contender for Joshua's title. Now, how a casino can look at this guy and reach the conclusion that if these guys fought eight times, eight times, Anthony Joshua would win seven of the eight. Keep in mind, on the Joshua side, the odds are even more preposterous. Right? You're paying something like a minus 1,600. If you're betting on the Joshua side, the casino's telling you that if they fought 17 times, Joshua would win 16 of the 17. 
Does anyone at the casino know that Joseph Parker went the distance with Joshua? That Joseph Parker at the end of that fight looked a hell of a lot better than Dylan White looked at the end of his fight against Joseph Parker. Right? Joseph Parker's pristine, folks. Clear face, he's talking, he's joking with the interviewer. Right? That's Joshua's last fight. He's being priced like he's prime Larry Holmes. Like he's the Lennox Lewis who destroyed Michael Grant. Like he's the Lennox Lewis who beat David Tua. Right? So I know, understand, profits are the difference between what the public thinks and what's actually going on. I know you're in the casino and someone sees you buying a ticket that says Pravetkin to win the heavyweight title over Joshua in the UK and people are going to start laughing. Right? They're not going to understand what you're doing with the hedge, the under eight and a half. Just understand, if Joshua comes out and destroys Pravetkin inside of the midway point of the ninth round, you're good. You're good. If Pravetkin comes out, moves too much, has Joshua looking big, easy to find, plotting, takes him out, right, at any time in the fight, you're good. If he does it inside of the midway point of the ninth round, you win both halves of the bet. But I do need for you to understand the risk involved. If Joshua gets a late stoppage, like he did against Carlos Tacco, if Joshua wins by decision, like he did against Joseph Parker, you lose it all. Right? That's how I see it. I expect a dangerous fight where Pravetkin gets Joshua out of his shell. Joshua strikes me as a bit too structured. I believe Pravetkin will know how to get him out of his rhythm. And then he's going to be in trouble. Folks, look at the end of the David Price fight. David Price looks like he's been hit by a car. Right? David Price had to get stitches after the fight. David Price goes down hard. Right? Pravetkin gets hit himself in that fight. Right? Would have fallen down but for the ropes. Right? This is a guy who's willing to raise room temperature. Right? Now, we saw Dylan White raise room temperature a little bit against Joshua when they fought. If room temperature is raised and Joshua isn't able to hide behind a jab like he did against Joseph Parker, if the other guy is actually throwing punches back at him and moving more than Charles Martin, who Joshua finds with the right hand twice and Martin's practically in the same place. Right? If Prevetkin isn't over by the ropes like Kevin Johnson was against Anthony Joshua, like Dylan White ended up against Anthony Joshua, if Prevetkin is moving, keeping this fight in the middle of the ring, coming in at times, backing out at times, but not getting hit by Joshua's jab, Think Alvarez against Sergei Kovalev in that recent fight, right? Are you confident that Joshua, who looked dead in the water in the middle of his fight against Vladimir Klitschko, is going to have the stamina to be as dominating as this line suggests? I don't have that level of confidence in Joshua. I think this is a close fight, dare I say. This fight looks 50-50-ish to me, quite frankly. Right? I give Pravetkin the edge, straight up, to win the fight. I view the casino line as a gift. Right? It's close. Both guys have a lot going for them. But I, I actually think this is Pravetkin's moment here. 
right? The fact that they're offering an eight and a half round over under provides a hedging opportunity at a minus 160. I have no idea what the casino is doing offering anyone a plus 700 on Alexander Povetkin. Again, this guy's a long time contender. Long time contender. Fighting a relative newbie, heavyweight champion, whose biggest win is getting off the canvas and stopping a Vladimir Klitschko coming off a loss. Right? The line's out of whack. It doesn't reflect the fighter's actual chances of winning the fight. This fight's competitive. Google David Price's comments about the betting line and public sentiment regarding this fight. Right? If you're someone who's not afraid to be laughed at when the rest of the crowd thinks they're watching Secretariat or a complete mismatch, right? If you're not afraid to be laughed at and if you realize that contenders are dangerous and don't warrant plus 700 lines, then strongly consider taking Povetkin to win this fight hedged with the under eight and a half rounds. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section to this video. Thanks for stopping by.